Hey everybody, it is Ronnie again, because I'm always here. <laughs> and right now I have, and the person in the screen next to me is an amazing writer named Tom Parnell, who is here today to speak with us about his new movie, Painkiller, which is amazing and everyone needs to go see it. <laughs> so thank you so much for speaking with me. It's awesome to have you here. Thanks, Ronnie. Glad so the first question is the age old question that everybody asks and I'm sure everyone gets bored with, but you know, we have to ask it. Uh, tell us about the film. <laughs> well, unfortunately it's not a, it's not a happy tale. I mean, I, you know, Mark and I, Mark Savage and I have, we've had two other, three other films and, and we were in the middle of writing another film that now is actually in pre-production for the summer, but you know, my son passed away December 23rd, 2017 of an opioid overdose. And, and you know, I started seeing a grief counselor immediately. I still do, because um, I really find that it helps me get through this. And if there's no getting through it, you know, one of the lines in the movie I wrote was that, that pain is the price we pay for the memories. So if you're not willing to endure the pain, then you're going to give up the memories. And I'm not willing to do that. So she suggested, other people suggested, what are you going to do, you know, to, to preserve his legacy, to, you know, and, and I'm thinking, you know, he's 22. He's about to start his life. I don't know how to what legacy they were talking about. And then um, I didn't want to start another foundation for drug abuse and, and overdose. There's so many of them. I mean, for that matter, I could just, you know, donate to them. But I wanted to do something for him. But I kind of let it go because I couldn't think of anything at first. And, and then, uh, you know, Mark and I began talking and came up with the, the idea to honor him was let's write a script about somebody in a similar situation. Um, and it's not Jordan's story or my story by any stretch. The only consistency is that he lost his only daughter. I lost my only son. Um, so we, we bounced it around and then he flew to Tampa and we began writing. We wrote the script in about a week, I think, the first the first draft uh, because it just came out of my heart. You know, and so um, so it's about a father that loses you know, his only his only child um, to an opioid overdose. And, and and like in my own personal story, I mean, he didn't know that you know, she was taking the drugs. Um, and I didn't either, you know, my son was not, she wasn't, my son was not an addict in the, in the way we, we think about that, you know, in the common sense of the word, I mean, there'd been no rehab, he had shown no other real issues, um, before just typical college student drinking too much, you know, but then I thought back at my, my college days, you know, my goodness. And so I figured, you know, you grow out of it like, like we all do, but with these damn pills, you know, they don't know, they think, you know, you drink too much beer, you wake up with a headache, you know, but you take these things and you just stop breathing. And, and that's how so many people are dying. So it, this film was made, you know, for that reason. I mean, to, to create a legacy for him, for me to try to give back, to try to save a life. You know, I've told a bunch of people, if I, if, if, if I probably won't ever get any feedback that way, but if I could save one life with this film, um, then it would be worth it. And it would, it would, and I think Jordan would be proud, but I didn't want to do a documentary. You know, I mean, like, I don't know if you saw the documentary last night on HBO, Crime of the Century, but, you know, it was like a longer thrown out version of, of what we did in Painkiller. Uh, the statistics are the same because they're the same, but I didn't want to create a documentary and make people feel like they were being preached at or taught something, you know, I, want, I thought let's entertain them and then somehow sneak in all the, the bad crap and the things that have been going on with Big Pharma and, and how many people are dying every year in this country from opioid overdose. So hopefully we entertained you while stuffing the message down your throat and you know, that, that, you know, people that maybe don't know this, you know, they, they've never had an injury. They go to the doctor, he prescribes oxycodone or oxycontin for God's sakes. And they, they don't realize, um, you know, I've had a friend of mine tell me he, he did that. He took one pill. He slept better than he had since he was a teenager. And he felt so great that night. He woke up the next morning and thought, oh my God, I can't take any more of these. I mean, you can, you can tell the statistics say you can become addicted in five days. You know, he knew right then after one pill, and he flushed the rest of me, he wouldn't take anymore. But not everybody obviously does that. You know, we all want to feel good. If we're in pain, you want the pain to go away. You stop taking the pill, the pain comes back. Well, I don't want to hurt anymore. You know, and so they take another one and another one. And next thing you know, it's just creating a, a, a country of addicts. Yep. That, that's why I made, that's why I wrote the script and why we made the movie. Um, so I have to ask, um, being, because I know that you, 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 played a part in this film and i know that you worked very closely with the shooting of the film and everything was it a little difficult to do it like you know be there sometimes did you ever have find yourself well i mean mark mentioned you know there were times when you had to walk away was it just like 
is it just all surreal for you sometimes? Um, at, at, at some points, um, you know, my character, I mean, I, you know, I played the, the, the doctor. I mean, I was in stress to kill too. I was a good doctor. Okay. Good, good doctor. <laughs> told, told Billy had to go get rid of uh, the stresses in his life. So he started killing idiots, you know? And so, and so that's why, you know, I wrote myself obviously back into this as, as his cardiologist and he comes to, to see me when he sees I'm getting suspended, but, um, you know, some of the scenes were, but you gotta understand Bill was me. You know, and so it was Bill's lines that I wrote that that, you know, that he would be you know saying what was in my heart. And I'm, I was so busy being it was it was tough at times to write it because I tried to just absolutely grab everything out of my heart and everything that I that I felt when when Bill says to the detective, you know, that I'm not blameless here. You know, why didn't I know what was going on? Why didn't I why didn't I see his pain? Why didn't I have him prepared for this? You know, I could have been a better father. I mean, things like that are things that you, you think of, I think of all the time. And so I pulled every one of those gut wrenching emotions out and tried to get it onto this film, and and so, and so no, it wasn't real hard because I was I was so busy trying to be the filmmaker, you know. I mean, I'm the continuity, you know, Nazi, and and I I'm, I constantly, I mean, I rewrite as we're filming a lot a lot of times. I'll work with Bill with Michael, you know. Does this line feel right? What do you think? Let now that it's, I just see it differently, so I'd, I'd be over there modifying the script, going over it with them, and so I was so busy working, you know, during during those scenes that it wasn't really that bad filming it and you know how it is with film you're filming the ending first the middle last the first, you know so you're not chronological so you know you're usually popping from one scene to another so it, it wasn't it wasn't terrible however the first time that i watched it the rough cut that was tough and 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 i watched it with my daughter and you know we both got kind of emotional so yes but now i've seen it 150 times so you know, 30, 35 rewrites and, and all the editing so i'm okay so I was this movie kind of in a sense therapeutic for you? I mean well my my therapist thinks so. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, told her, I told her it costs a little more than she does. Not much, but you know, um, so yes, I, I I think it was. But you know what? It doesn't change anything. I mean, I still wake up every morning and I still realize he's gone and I've got a big picture of him. In, the, in my hallway that, that I say goodbye to every morning when I leave. I've got a, I've got a crystal pendant with his image in, in, in my vehicles. And so he's always with me. So, you know, I, I just, it, it felt good getting this out, you know, and, and, and really sharing my pain, you know, and people didn't want, oh my God, some of the people in, in our lives, you know, came to me and didn't want me to make this film because they didn't want, and there's been articles run about because I've, I've got a lot of following here in Tampa, not for being a filmmaker, for being a lawyer. And, <laughs> <laughs> trying to turn that around here at this late stage of life but <laughs> but they, they they didn't want people to know you know to, to, we don't need to spread what what happened to jordan you know i know a, another attorney whose son died several years ago and i i knew what the truth was and of course the official cause of death was he was asleep and he fell out of bed and hit his head on a, on a bookcase well you know i wasn't doing that you know what i'm human he was human we're all human and i'm not ashamed of what happened to him because it could happen to anybody he didn't do it on purpose he, he, you know, he, he didn't know what he was doing. He didn't realize the strength of these drugs and so many kids don't. So, but, but every day, you know, it's, 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 a, it's, it's not a struggle. It doesn't sound like I'm gets gut wrenching every day. It's not, but I think about him every single day. I can completely understand that. Um, I have a pendant for a niece. I just lost just recently too. So um, I do have to ask when okay so with casting you guys have an amazing cast as i was speaking with mark about it like i mean well bill and michael perry and then you've got camila gaston who i just love her um i gotta know if, what was it just like as a writer how is it seeing your characters come to life like I'm, I'm almost curious how everyone's a little bit different. So like when you, when you write this character and then, you know, Bill comes up here and portrays it, what's it like, what's the experience for you? <laughs> In the first film that I did, I mean, I, I, especially hearing my words coming out of Armand DeSanti's mouth, I, I thought I was going to pass out, you know, it's like my first one. So <laughs> goosebumps where I didn't know I had skin, you know, it's like, um, yeah, it's, it's amazing. I mean, both of them really, really garnered this role. I mean, Bill was fantastic. I mean, he was good in Stress to Kill. He's good in all of this stuff. But, you know, he's known more as a horror, horror film actor. And, and the passion, he says this all the time. He said it in multiple interviews. That, 
and because of his friendship with me and knowing the pain that I, I had I was going through that he wanted to really bring enough to this role to make to make me happy to make me feel you know like like he did and he's still not sure that he did no matter how many times I tell him he did he still he still says the same thing when anybody asks him but I mean the, the passion well you can see it you've seen the movie I mean he really brought the pain to life and that's what I wanted and Perret, my God, he was so sleazy. I mean, we did our best to make him a real sleaze, you know, with the office scene and the, you know, and the other stuff he was doing. And, and, but then Mark had this idea that almost to me had the, had the audience kind of feeling sorry for him with the whole father angle. You know, like we've all tried to please our father and, and you know, so you, that's, that's in there, but he, he was a sleaze bag deluxe and really, really did a great job. So yes, it yeah, was. Yeah, he did. <laughs> everybody i thought everybody brought their a game I, there wasn't a weakness you know and I, I just tried to hold my own that's what i i told bill you know i don't want to stand out as being the weakest actor in the movie <laughs> i'm not trying to outdo you guys but uh, but it was a it was a blast it was a blast working with michael you know he was a, he was I, he was a hero of mine back in eddie and the cruisers days because I, I just I, well at first i hated him because he was so damn handsome you know <laughs> of course i know that wasn't his voice on the, on the soundtrack it was cafferty and beaver brown but but uh, but he was you know he they all stayed in my house too we had like a big dormitory thing i mean it's the, <laughs> i had half the crew bill stayed there michael stayed there of course mark and uh you know getting up to get a cup i usually live alone with two cats you know in this big old house uh, i'm stumbling in the kitchen to get a cup of coffee bumping into people you know that was that was weird but after the last to the shoot and they left i was lonely it's like <laughs> where'd they go a little emptiness syndrome <laughs> exactly <laughs> cats missed them too <laughs> so i i do have to ask because bill oberst jr plays bill, bill coincidence johnson. or did you well he was bill johnson and stress to kill so you know since we're the same characters we carried it over but but no because you know when you're trying to when you're trying to come up with names in a script i mean you don't want to be too cliche or you don't want to be i'm not going to call him gustafson or something but but <laughs> i mean i knew he'd answer to bill so and remember that was my first film his name is bill let him be bill i mean i was thomas mack and my first name's thomas so you uh -huh. know you know you because you're just making names up anyway so you know that's why let's, <laughs> let's just keep him bill <laughs> it's part of the fun though for me sometimes is just making up the names i don't know i like the weird well, alan rhodes and strauss and you know we made up uh we made up a few but bill we had to keep we had to keep like the like the previous movie <laughs> in fact I did purgatory road where i play a sheriff our second film this is mark now mark wants me to be my last name to be mac now in every film we make and so i was i was sheriff mac and i was the sheriff of safe haven county mississippi thank you very much <laughs> that's that's on mark not me so um i'm i'm curious were you involved any with um the post-production of the film um not too much you know that's that's mark's bag I mean, he'll send me, he'll send me some rough cuts and we'll go over them a little bit. So I'll have some input. I did some of the hips with the sound editing on the first two and oh my God, I didn't, it's just so laborious that I couldn't sit there anymore. My butt was numb and I was bored and you know, I'm over texting. I'm supposed to be listening. <laughs> I'm like, I'm not, I'm just not doing this anymore. I'll, 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 I'll executive produce it. I'll write it. I'll act in it. I when you say that's a wrap, I'm out. It's up to you to put it together. <laughs> and he does a fantastic job, as you saw. He's he's unbelievable. So, you know, it gets, gets me real quick. These these people that they do in a few movies and then they want to become directors. Oh my God. I, I can't even. I mean, I, I help him in a sense direct only that I'm looking for things. You know, I'm not doing the lighting and the angles, the movement, all the stuff that goes into it, because it's just it's incredible to watch. And I've been on more than one movie set. I mean, you know, with, I've been in other mo people's movies and watching the different directors, you know, and how they operate. And, and, and they're all talented. It's just amazing. But Mark is, uh, you know, to me, he's the, the creme de la creme, I think. But, uh, but what, here's, a, here's a quick story for you. So we're in, we're in Mississippi. It's 22 degrees. I'm freezing. It's midnight. We're shooting this scene in Purgatory Road from a barn, a broken down barn, glass over the, the cameras in there. We're looking at a monitor with our headphones. And the, the two actors go around the back. It's going to be a sexual scene. And so there was, a, there was a dried up artesian well back there, right? And so the crew was freezing the whole night. So they, somebody lit a fire in there because we had those rocket heaters, but you can't have those on when you're filming. Mm -hmm. So they built a little campfire in the artesian well. So here we are huddled together watching the monitor. 
and, and here goes the scene and the scene was really good, you know, cut. And I tapped Mark on the shoulder and I said, um, where did the fire come from? And he looks at me and I knew he knew exactly what I meant. I mean, we didn't show anyone starting the fire. Nobody to our knowledge has been back there for, you know, 50 years. Where did the fire come from? And I swear to God, here's what he said. He just looked perplexed and he goes, I don't know. It's the woods. There's a fire. And I'm like, that's what you're going with. Okay. I told you. To come. <laughs> and so there's a fire. If you watch the movie, there's a fire in the artesian well. And that's where it came from. <laughs> yeah. It's just there. It's the just the light, But the lighting was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> so, um, Mark did mention that you guys plan to continue this story. Um, any hints as to what we might see in a painkiller too? <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, I don't want to get, I don't want to be a spoiler alert. And give the, give, <laughs> we did kind of set it up for that, didn't we? And just, God, just about everybody, all my family and friends and, and colleagues that have, that have watched it say the same thing. Are you going to, you going to make a sequel? You, you know, so we, <laughs> we had that ending obviously purposeful to, to, to leave it open if we'd intend if we wanted to bills bill really wants to do one and, and so yes we've we've tossed about a few ideas we haven't we haven't hit on anything solid yet but we still got another movie to make here soon but yeah i, I suspect bill and dr mac might might ride again together yeah. <laughs> i'm hopeful <laughs> so that does bring me to my next question is what um what are we going to see next from you because, you know, you run the gamut. So I know I believe you have quite a few projects coming up soon, don't you? If you're in Florida and you're involved in an accident, make sure you call me. Tom Parnell. <laughs> let's, let's, let's make this clear. I'm, I'm not giving up my day job. No? Unless, unless our fine governor you know, uh, eliminates tort law, then I might retire. But, uh, <laughs> well, I've got a movie coming up. It's called, um, it's called Advocate. I was just in a movie with Jimmy Fitzpatrick called Soul, Soul uh, Soulmates. That's going to be incredible. It's going to be really soon. But that was his film. It was a love story. I don't do that. I, I, I acted in it. I played a private detective, but I don't write love stories. <laughs> the one I did write that, that Mark and I wrote, it was this was really my favorite, my favorite script, I think, before Painkiller, because I wrote it before Painkiller. But, um, you know, coming up with my son and and friends in, in Little League sports and, and the sporting world and seeing how parents push their children, it's a story about a father that pushes his son physically in baseball to the point that he gets crippled. And then later in life, you know, the boy, you know, has somewhat of a normal life, but he's crippled. He has a leg brace and, and he starts taking pictures of little league games, soccer games, you know, like they do. And the mothers buy the pictures, you know, they'll do it as a sideline job. And one day he's at the ball field and he sees the father berating his son, just, just tearing him up a little boy, like six years old, which I saw so many times. Um, and he snaps. And so he, he tries to, to reason with some of them, but he ends up killing overzealous sports parents. So that's something that <laughs> it might even throw a cheerleader mom in there somewhere, but um, that's what the next, next one's about. Something I think so many people can relate to that. I mean, I, I, I kid around and say that if this really was happening and it was in my town, I would have been a victim because he would have killed me. And so I've got a different perspective. I'm writing it from the other side, but I really know what it's like you know, my son was a heck of a pitcher, played college ball, but um, yeah, we pushed the kids too much. It was so important to win that it was ridiculous. And looking back, I wish I'd have stuck a golf club in his hand and been done with it, you know, or, or a violin, or a violin, you know, but uh, I mean, not that it weren't good times, but you know, we parents can go crazy. You've read about the cheerleader moms, and, you know, that, that plot to kill one another because they can't, yeah. <laughs> it's not going to make the team, you know, here we're screaming at six-year-olds, run, run, chase, you know, we, you know, we, we lost oh gee and the whole everybody's upset it's ridiculous so we that's five-year-olds in beauty pageants now i mean <laughs> oh, yeah. oh yeah so that's that's what spawned uh, that script that i wrote several years ago but that's that's been my it's been one of my favorites i'm, I'm looking forward to it i'm actually going to play the father the abusive father in the flashbacks so because because i know i can bring a lot to that role and so <laughs> and we're, we're, we're not casting anyone but me in that so I gotta ask, um, you are an attorney also. Um, do you find it hard sometimes to balance, you know, the attorney work with the film work? 
Well, you know, I w- probably if I would if if I was back in my 30s or 40s, back when I was, <laughs> because I I've got my own law firm and I've had it for what I've been practicing now 37 years. Um, you know, it's Gibbs and Parnell, and Mr. Gibbs retired 10 years ago. He was my mentor. Um, it it kind of runs itself now. You know, I've got mm-hmm. a office manager that does. I've got four three other attorneys. I've got um, a, a staff that you know. I mean, I still put out fires. I make the big decisions, but I don't really. I like to kid. You know, pretend like I need to be here every day, but I really don't. And so, you know, when I'm, when I'm off doing a film, it seems to get along okay without me. I don't know how that works, but, uh, <laughs> but yes, if I was going to trial all the time and I was working the way I had to hump to get, you know, to get my business to where it is, I, it would be tough. But now, you know, I'm kind of, I hate to say it, semi-retired, but, you know, I kind of come and go as I, as I want. So, you know, when, when we're writing, in fact, Mark's coming in at the end of the month and we're going to work on, work on some scripts and, uh, and start preparing for the other film. So, you know, I'll be able to take the time off and, and, and be able to do this you remember i didn't i didn't write my first script until i was 54 55 um i never even saw a script i mean i write poetry i, I do some other creative stuff but i never tried to write a script i never read one and and i tried to write a book a couple of times and i thought who am i fooling i, I, feel like I don't have the patience to read a book <laughs> so, <laughs> so you know, i can't write you know the sun shone on the lake like a glimmering whatever I, that's just not me and then when i read a script i'm like and this is just talking. I can do this. So that's where that's where it started. Actually, the first one I was out, Mark's acting in another film of his in L.A. And I told him about this list I have. Of, um, it's a it's a hundred 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 people. It's not people. It's behavior. But a hundred things that I hated about people. I hated this type of behavior. You know, getting getting on an elevator on the first floor before I can get the hell off. You know, things like that. It wasn't about individuals and people that back into parking spaces. It's just. A, I'm sorry if you do that, but it annoys the shit out of me. So anyway, um, I live in Seattle. A lot of our parking spaces were made to back into, so it just kind of becomes a natural habit for us. <laughs> well, it's not Florida, okay? You're, you're forgiven. But anyway, when I told him that, that's where I, th- I thought, you know, what if a guy? Because because sometimes I feel like it gives me high blood pressure. Um, he had high <laughs> blood pressure. He, that he could lower his blood pressure. You know, I didn't suggest as a cardiologist that you take some pills or try diet. You know, I just suggested just remove the stresses. And and I thought, what if he kills he kills the idiots? You know, and you can't plot it because you would lose the spontaneity of it. You mm-hmm. can't use a gun because you're gonna everybody's gonna see it. You know, unlike painkiller, where there seems to be nobody else around when we do all the killing, which is you know convenient. <laughs> uh, but so we came up with the idea of a dart, a dart gun, a blow dart. And so we actually get some poison from his friend, Stan, who is a chemist, conveniently. And, uh, and this, this poison is really powerful. This is dropping people like that. But he starts darting them. And that's, uh, that's, that's, that was how that spawned. And that was our first film. And it was a blast. Nice. <laughs> nice. Well, I want to thank you so much for speaking with me. I really do appreciate it. And um, I really do appreciate Painkiller. I love the movie. I love the message. It's a message that needs to be heard and stuff like that because it's a growing epidemic here um my tribe the couch tribe here in washington just opened up their third rehab and it's one of the very common things that they're dealing with around here um you know the sobering real quick the sobering numbers around is you know seventy thousand americans are dying every year okay and and when covid took over and the opioids just disappeared uh from from the press um you know, it spiked almost 90 during from November of 19 to November of 20. Don't know what it'll be this year, but there's no there's no reason to think it's going to it's going to decrease very much. And so, you know, just spread the word. I mean, I made the movie. I finance the movie. And I'll say this again. I don't care about profit from this movie. I'm sure our distributors do. But I mean, I just <laughs> I, I just want I just want it to be seen and heard and talked about and trying to do what I can to spread the word. There's a lot of companies, a lot of uh, organizations that are doing great works in that that way. This was my way of of trying to do a little bit what I could, that what I do, that what I do, what I do, and 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 that's it. That again, if I could save one life, and I I hope I've had enough you know input now, and and, and it's been seen enough to to maybe have some influence on somebody. But you know, tell your friends, family, you, you see them taking pain pills, or they're injured, or whatever. I mean, listen, watch the movie, listen to the stats. And see that it can happen. One last thing was Bill says when a guy we had a guy call up the radio show and say, um, you know, these losers, if they would just take the prescribed amount, you know, they wouldn't have any problem. And he talks about his, and this was about a friend of mine. And Bill says, my best friend on this earth, you know, raised four children, was married to the same woman for 40 years, did two tours in Vietnam, never had a drink, never had a drug. 
He was a self-made millionaire. He had a knee replacement. It went, he was in pain. The doctor gave him oxycodone. In six weeks, he was addicted. In six months, he was dead. And if it could happen to him, it could happen to anyone. And that's the final message that I'd like to send out to. That's a good message. Definitely. Definitely a good message. Well, again, thank you. I appreciate it. Um, I hope this film gets lost of success. It's, it should. It seems like it's, it's going to have legs. And this horse is going to run and be able to compete in the Derby. So, I hope and, so. And on a second thought, I also have to thank you because one of my best, my favorite films out there is um, Stress to Kill. So and I was very, it was like. You're the one that watched it. <laughs> loved it. It was like, as I told Mark, it was like, for me, it was almost like a sequel to um, Falling Down with Michael Douglas. Oh, that's what it felt like for me. It was like, just very good. I loved it. So thank you thank for that too. <laughs> Thank you, Ryan. Thanks for having me, buddy. Thanks. All right. Appreciate it. So let me...